I thought I'd talk about the greater momentum on its own um, because it's something students often ask me about. Uh, where does it go to? So how many layers has it got? Is it made of peritoneum? Doesn't look like it's made of peritoneum and so on and so on. Really, really good thoughtful questions because there's a whole bunch of complicated stuff going on here. So, the greater momentum. Um, why is it there? What's it made of? Um, what's it good for? The room is set up for people who are thinking about coming to university here. So well, that's pretty, I'll nick that as a backdrop. Um, momentum, greater momentum. Um, this is it here, it's this, if it's not pinned down in the model, it's this thing, this flap that floats over the small intestine. You have to pull it back to see most of the intestines deep to it. Um, the Latin word momentum means apron. So that's where that word has come from, certainly according to Arnold's Glossary of Anatomy anyway. I've also read that the ancient Egyptians used to look at the omentum to determine their omens, and that's where the name came from, but I am somewhat sceptical of that. Epiplune, <laughs> it's a great word, is the ancient Greek word meaning floating, and this kind of floats over the small intestine. So although this is called the greater omentum, we'll see that blood vessels and other structures around here relating to this get called epiploic or omental. So that's, that's where those two terms come from. Um, while we're talking about fun historical stuff, um, Galen, uh, one of the very early anatomists, wrote that gladiators, yeah, we're, we're going that far back, um, there was a gladiator who had much of his greater omentum removed after a stab injury and he complained for the rest of his life that he was cold. We might see some relation to the structure in that as we go. To talk about the greater omentum we're going to need to look at some other structures in the abdomen. So here's the stomach. Um, if I take the greater omentum off, as you may well be aware already, the greater omentum is running from the greater curvature of the stomach. Let's take the liver out. Here's the stomach here. And the other structure we need to consider is the transverse colon here. So we've got the stomach, we've got the small intestine, we've got the large intestine here, and here's the transverse colon. And the greater omentum is running from the greater curvature of the stomach down and back up again to the transverse colon. How does that work then? As is often the case, we've got to go back to the embryo. Now this very long coiled tube here started off just as a, a simple tube in the embryo. And that simple tube in the embryo was in the early the early cavity, the early abdominal space, as it were, within the embryo, and it was suspended in that space by, by a mesentery. We got the cling film again. So, um, that tube, so the, this stuff, the peritoneum, uh, lines the abdominal cavity, and it's a single sheet of a serous um, a membrane which then runs out and covers all of the viscera here. We're not doing the whole thing today but the early embryonic gut tube and the early embryonic cavity was lined by that sheet of peritoneum that then ran together so we have two layers of peritoneum coming together and then went around the early gut tube and suspended it from the posterior abdominal wall and that dorsal mesentery or the level of the stomach we might call it the dorsal mesogastrium gaster stomach belly um, is where the greater momentum comes from oh, it's the hardest thing of all is oh get me cling film off right okay so so if this is the posterior abdominal wall, it's lined by a, a single layer of peritoneum. So this would be the parietal peritoneum. And then the stomach, as part of that early gut tube, when the stomach starts to form, it's, it's here. It's, it's that side of the peritoneum. Which means that, as it pushes out into the space, as it were, you've got to remember everything is actually really tightly packed together, but it's suspended by then two 
layers of peritoneum forming that mesentery or the dorsal mesogastrium. Now as the stomach it, it rotates and expands and gets the shape that it's got here, that's the mesentery then that's attaching it to the posterior abdominal wall. But what happens is, is, is the mesentery at the greater curvature of the stomach, because we've got, we've got two layers here, right? It grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. It descends down into the abdomen and then grows back up again. So we have two layers going down and two layers coming back up. And in the original instance, this is anchoring the stomach to the posterior abdominal wall. So then there's the greater curvature of the stomach. There's those two layers of that mesentery that have just grown and grown and grown and grown and grown. And as we put that back, what happens is then those two layers curve back. And in the adult, this then is called the greater omentum. So we, these are all sheets of peritoneum, but where those sheets of peritoneum form structures, we like to give them names because that's how we can describe where things are. That's what anatomy is. So the great, this then is the greater omentum forming here. It's two sheets of peritoneum. They loop down and they loop back up again. And in the adult, they actually run back to the transverse colon they blend with the transverse colon and the transverse colon has got its own mesentery so the transverse colon is then attached to the posterior abdominal wall by the transverse mesocolon which is the same thing it's two layers of peritoneum that have come together to form a mesentery and that's what the greater omentum is so you might hear the greater omentum described as four layers or two layers do you understand why that might be the case it is a two-layered thing, but because it loops down and back up again, in total it's forming four layers. Do you see what I mean? Don't get confused by that. Um, it's basically this idea. Two layers of peritoneum go down and loop back up again and blend with the, the mesocolon there. Remember we've got that we've got two layers there coming together, looping around. And going back up again. That's what the greater omentum is. And the greater omentum then becomes filled with fat. It's a great store of adipose tissue. You can store a lot of fat here. So if, if somebody is very fat, if they're obese, they will store a lot of fat in the greater omentum. Is that why the gladiator got cold? Maybe. Maybe. Um, it has a rich blood supply um, and it also has um, lymphatic drainage and um, immune cells within it. You'll hear descriptions of milky white spots. And in those milky white spots, there are collections of lymphocytes and macrophages and that sort of thing, which gives you a clue as to what its function probably is. It certainly has immune functions. So it's called the policeman of the abdomen. Um, it doesn't move around itself, but of course everything that it's resting on, the, the small bowel does move through peristalsis and of course the diaphragm is moving up and down. And it seems that if an area of, uh, of, of the bowel, for example, is inflamed, it will, uh, it will kind of adhere to that inflammation and limit the inflammation of the bowel to that region. It also seems to be able to absorb foreign bodies from the, ab from the cavity here, on, you know, from this Cavity is kind of the wrong word, but it can absorb foreign bodies and get rid of them, right? So it can help in an immune response, a local immune response. It's even got angiogenic properties, so it can encourage the growth of new blood vessels, so it can encourage growth and repair after, after pathology, injury, damage, that sort of thing, right? So the omentum has an immune role in the abdomen. Blood supply, well, running around the greater curvature of the stomach, you can just about see, there you go, we've got these arteries here, and we have the, the right and left gastroepiploic or gastroamental arteries. Ah, that's why they're called that, because they're supplying blood to the stomach, the gastro bit, and they're also then supplying blood to the amentum, so the gastro mental arteries. And then we'll find right, middle, and left amental arteries running with the, within the amentum, and probably various other branches as well. It has a rich blood supply. Um, these arteries, the gastro mental arteries, are ultimately branches from the celiac trunk from the aorta. They're, they're branches of, uh, of the foregut arteries. 
I said that parts of um, the peritoneum, when they form kind of ligaments and other sheets, they also get names. Now, the gastrocolic ligament is another word that you might hear applied to the greater omentum because it's running from the stomach to the colon. So the gastrocolic ligament also refers to the, the greater omentum. In fact, there are other parts of the greater omentum running to other things like to the spleen and, and what have you that also get other names, but I'm not going to add complexity to this right now. Um, so that's it. The greater omentum. The hardest thing is understanding those layers of peritoneum. Um, but that's where it is. That's what it's good for. That is blood supply. Um, the other thing I'd say is that when we have the abdomen, if you cut through all of the muscles and the skin, you cut through all of the fascia, you would then see the, a single layer of peritoneum, right? Because that'll be lining the internal surface of the abdominal wall. And when you cut through that, then you'll see the greater omentum, and then you lift the greater omentum, and then you see the small intestine. All right, so that's how it's organized. Right, what about the lesser momentum, you say? Well, next week, maybe? <laughs> okay. <laughs>